point, what I did is I actually left the room. I went to take a piss. I went to the bathroom. I went to take a phone call. I got a bottle of water. And after all of this, the fuse that I was putting six amps through, that was a two amp fuse, did not blow. I decided after several minutes at six amps, I'm gonna up it to eight amps. And it just kept going for about another minute. And it wasn't until I put 10 amps through that two amp fuse that it finally blew. Here, we're not talking about something like a knockoff shirt or even a knockoff Rolex or something. I'm not, I'm not saying that that would be right if you sold shirts of poor quality or a counterfeit Rolex, but these are not things that are going to kill somebody. Whereas electrical devices where you have faked ratings on them or you have done some sort of poor job in constructing them, can genuinely hurt people. Now, the problem that I have here is not that Amazon allows anybody to sell on the platform. The problem is that no matter how many reports they get, they keep the product up. My channel has 2 million subscribers. I'm not saying that to brag. I'm not saying that to say I'm better than you. Rather, I'm saying that to demonstrate that, I mean, if they don't care what I say, then you know, they're not gonna care what you say, which for certainly it's, it's to demonstrate not how great I am, but it's to demonstrate just how little they give a shit about you because you're the person who's gonna buy this. This video is about a million views at this point, and uh, this video over here has about over a quarter of a million views. Now, many of my viewers have recreated this experiment. They've done it because I showed you exactly what tools you needed and how to run it over here with the resistors and the power supplies and everything, and they have reported these devices to Amazon as unsafe because it's a link on the page where you can do that. In spite of the fact that many people have reported these products as unsafe, and as you can see on the page over here, you're still able to purchase this product almost eight months later. Now, one of the other things you may notice is the review. You'll see that the reviews are very good for this product, and there's many of them. And a big part... Opinion is because a lot of people get these things in the mail. It is a gift card that you can use, and in order to get the gift card activated, the seller wants you to leave a five-star review of their particular product. And this doesn't really seem to be policed. I imagine that if they are not policing products that are actually dangerous, that could potentially kill people on their platform as a result of electrical fires or mishaps, that there's probably not a lot of policing going on of gift card pay-to-play scams. It's obvious that a platform the size of Amazon cannot police all of their products. But the point that I wanted to make with this one is even when it was a genuinely dangerous product, and even when it was somebody with 2 million subscribers that's somewhat known for some reputation in electronics repair, that they are not gonna take it seriously. It's not just when it's you, it's virtually anybody. They don't care about anybody. And the problem here is that it's gotten to a point where it's so obnoxious that these reg regulatory agencies are saying, you know what? I don't care if you're a platform, we're gonna hold you accountable and responsible anyway. Over here, it says that they are issuing a decision and an order in a unanimous vote. The commission determined that Amazon was a distributor of products that are defective or fail to meet federal consumer product safety standards, and therefore bears legal responsibility for their recall. More than 400,000 products are subject to this order. Specifically, faulty carbon monoxide detectors, hair dryers without electrocution protection, and children's sleepwear that violated federal flammability standards. The commission determined that these products listed on Amazon.com and sold by third-party sellers using the Fulfilled by Amazon program pose a substantial product hazard under the Consumer Product Safety Act. Further, Amazon failed to notify the public about these hazardous products and did not take adequate steps to encourage its customers to return or destroy them. Did I just say customers? I did, didn't I? Wow. Thereby leaving consumers at substantial risk of injury. Amazon argued before an administrative law judge in the commission that it was not a distributor and bore no responsibility for the safety of the products sold under its Fulfilled by Amazon program. And this is the part that's particularly egregious. I, again, to be clear, I understand the idea that Amazon, if you want to have a marketplace, if you want to have an eBay, if you want to have an Amazon, you cannot have an eBay or an Amazon and expect a company to inspect everything. And that's not what people are asking. The reason I think we've gotten to this point is because they have so egregiously given a middle finger to every single person that has ever reported an issue with a product. How many people here have left a negative review for a product on Amazon only for that negative review to not show up? The reason that we are where we are is because Amazon has decided to give the middle finger to everybody who purchased a bad product. Personally speaking, as much as I want to see Amazon get screwed as a result of ignoring consumers and having absolutely no concern whatsoever about their safety, this is a decision that, is, that I have a little bit of pause with. Amazon is a platform, right? So if Amazon is a platform and you are going to hold them personally responsible for what happens on the platform, 
does that mean that YouTube has to get held responsible for what people say on its platform? Like, it's, it's one of those questions of the slippery slope thing for me. I have absolutely no problem with Amazon getting screwed, but the problem is you're screwing Amazon because they were very, very irresponsible, and they went out of their way to give everybody a middle finger when it came to product safety or caring about their customers. So now does that mean that everybody is gonna have to deal with that as a result? Personally, I think that this may be a step in the right direction. When you go to Uniqlo or H&M or Macy's or JCPenney or even Goodwill, you're probably not gonna find clothing for children that doesn't meet basic fire retardant standards. Home Depot may sell you a vacuum cleaner that doesn't have the nicest HEPA filtration. They may not sell your preferred brand of acoustic insulation, but the stuff that you buy from there, it's not going to burn your house down. It's not going to give you cancer if you look at it the wrong way, the same way that some products on Amazon are going to. They have some sort of like realization that if we sell complete and utter garbage, we will get in trouble for it, that Amazon doesn't. So as much as this gives me pause, it's the whole holding platforms accountable for what users do on them thing. I do think Amazon has acted shittily enough in this case that I'm okay. This month, we got this Yeti dog wool completely free. Two toys, two treats, and the other products sold under its Fulfilled by Amazon program. And this is the part that's particularly egregious. I, again, to be clear, I understand the idea that Amazon, if you want to have a marketplace, if you want to have an eBay, if you want to have an Amazon, you cannot have an eBay or an Amazon. FTC is getting to the fines, because this fine over here is a fine of $0 up to 46,000 in this case actually meant zero. Another case of this that may black pill people who are in the audience was with the FCC. So there's a video that I did a while back <coughs> where I went over the fact that every single wireless carrier illegally sold your personal data, whether it was the bail bondsman or advertiser. It has had a good old blast selling it to everybody. I'll include all the documentation for that down below. Now, as you can see over here, they're talking about the fines. The face fines of more than 12 million, 80 million, 57 million. Verizon was fined almost 47 million. And when you take a look, at the 10Q or the 10K, in this case the 10K because it is annually for these companies. When you do the math on this, you have a company that made something around uh, 20 billion, then lost 8 billion, made 14 billion. Back of the napkin math, they're making something along the lines of $8 billion a year in profit, net, not income, profit. And then you look at this and they're getting fined less than $100 million for illegally selling all of your personal data in spite of their privacy policy and in spite of what is allowed by law. Do you think AT&T cares? They got fined less than 1%, not even 1% their worth, not 1% their, their net profit per year. They don't care. None of these carriers care. They're laughing at the FCC. They're doing this to the consumer. They sold your data. They made the money off of it. And then they got fined 0.2% or 0.5% of their net profit for the year. What's really going to matter here and how we're going to figure out if this has teeth is going to be in the fine. Is this going to be like what the FCC did where they find this company 0.2% of their net profit for the year? Is this going to be like the FTC finding companies that broke the Magnuson Moss warranty law where they were fined $0? Or is this gonna be something real? Is it gonna be something tangible? Is it gonna be the type of fine or action that finally, someday, results in this product not being on amazon.com? Is it gonna result in Amazon finally going after people who do this? We're giving you a $30 gift card. We want you to give us a five-star review. Please give us a five-star review. We will pay you for it. People in my audience have reported this to Amazon. They do nothing, they don't care. I'm hoping that the Consumer Product Safety Commission causes them to care. I'm hoping that they have the ability to hit them with something that matters. Sometimes I wonder if the reason that there are these particular caps on the fines are because the law hasn't been amended since 1962. You're like, back in my day, a gallon of milk cost a nickel. Like that kind of thing, you know, I remember. <laughs> I, I really do wonder if that's the case. Uh, and, and if that is the case, then like, why doesn't somebody update that shit? Clint. I don't, the thing is, uh, I don't even blame Amazon for what they're doing. I don't blame them. Like, I'm not even mad at Amazon because Amazon is like Clinton. Clinton, Clinton, come over here, show up here. Amazon is like Mr. Clinton the cat. You as the customer are like the chair. Amazon is supposed to try and scratch the chair. I would never get mad at Mr. Clinton for scratching the chair because he is a cat. However, our consumer protection agencies are supposed to put up scratching posts and they're supposed to police this so that Amazon doesn't scratch the chair. Like, he's gonna scratch my chair, that's what he does. He's a cat, 
I cannot be mad at him for this, but I will be mad at the consumer protection agencies that do nothing and allow you to get screwed while they pay a 0.2% fine after screwing you over. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. That's it for today, and as always, I hope you learned something. By the way, you may have noticed that this video sounded slightly different. Maybe it sounded like Lewis after swallowing a bottle of benzodiazepines, and that's not the case, even though it probably sounds like it. One of the criticisms I've gotten for a long period of time is you talk too fast, you sound like you've done a bunch of blow, I have to watch your videos in 0.5x, and I've decided to try a different approach. When I do these videos, it's kind of like a, a ventriloquist with a puppet. It's very awkward to have a puppet on your hand and be talking, so they often have a different voice for the puppet, maybe a little bit of a different personality for the puppet, and this is the same thing here. The views that I share with you on this channel are the same views that I would share in person. I don't wear different clothes so that I can try and sell you on crap that I wouldn't wear otherwise because I'm being paid for it. I don't, you know, I, I don't like have a special apartment so that I can show myself off as an influencer. You, what you see is what you get. However, in order to speak into a camera, which is a lens where I see a reflection of my shirt, I need to do something to make that work. It's not natural. It's speaking to people in, in real life, like that's doable. Speaking into a camera, it's just fucking weird. I don't know how to, I don't know how to put it. And there's a character that I've created that allows me to do that without feeling like I'm insane. And ironically, the character itself actually seems insane, but it allows me to feel more sane when I'm done. When I finish one of these videos, I actually feel like I've gotten my artistic outlet done for the day, and it allows me to go about my day in peace. It allows me to talk to people like I normally talk to people. It allows me to you know, go to the gym, go for a swim, work on my business, take a college course, whatever it is I need to do. If I don't do a video bombastically, I actually... I'm not kidding. I actually feel like I'm holding and having a piss. It's 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 it's, it's like that. It's it's something that is, it, it comes out in a natural way. People may think that this is the natural way, but I don't think it is. It actually feels really fucking weird. Anyway, I'm going to include a community poll down below. If you prefer Lewis pretending he's on benzos because you don't have to watch the video very fast or very slow, have to slow it down, then you can vote for that. If you find this Lewis as weird as I do, um, you can vote for that as well. Anyway, that's it for today. And uh, before I end the video, there is something that I do have to put on camera. One moment.
just like that, boy. Clinton's 15 now. Hey, this is an OnlyFans, bro. What are you doing? <laughs> Put that shit down. At least you're not doing it to the camera.
coming up on a major fundraising deadline, and there aren't many more between now and the election. So I am. Now, guys, before we get into this episode, I want to make sure you all are watching the electric Honda Beat conversion series where I convert a Honda Beat to electric on the cheap. Now remember, you guys all asked for an inexpensive EV build, but the numbers say otherwise, and this is why I do gas stuff. Now don't complain when I switch back to gas again because you're not watching the EV stuff. Anyways, so I made a video a few months ago about the Fisker Ocean, and I said prices were falling like crazy. These vehicles were once $70,000 and were cut down to $25,000. Fisker Oceans are now sub 25 grand. I said in the video at 20k I'm a buyer and at 15k I buy two. Well, something happened and I got a Fisker Ocean for an even better deal, but I couldn't have done it alone. My friend Terry, who is Coverman66 on YouTube, called me and said, Rich, I have a friend named Tony, who is Tony Bush Jr. on YouTube, selling an ocean at his dealer, Toyota One in Oakland, California, for 10 grand. The catch is it doesn't work, it doesn't charge, doesn't drive, and we figured you'd be the guy to LS swap it, seeing as you already have Ice-T, the V8 swap Tesla. Now, I want you to look at these three men, okay? What do these three men have in common? Well, they all work on own and love LS engines, so the immediate thought was the LS swap, but I can't bring myself to doing that. It's too much work for very little benefit, and the kicker, it only has 300 miles on it. Yes, 300 miles. This car is not even fully charged once in its life. Now, for 10 grand, even with the charging issue, I can use it as a lawn ornament. It's literally worth more than that in parts, seeing as Fisker owners are now scavenging what they can from online parts sellers. If you didn't know this, Windshields go for about $2,000 if you can find one, and the keys between $500 and $1,000 as they currently don't have the ability to make more because, well, the company's bankrupt. Well, this is gonna be a very different type of video because this is my literal first reaction to the car. I'm using the basic troubleshooting steps to show potential owners just how screwed you could be when something goes wrong with one of these cars. We didn't use Google, we didn't ask anyone, we didn't look anything up, so this is the first episode will be similar to a bunch of monkeys trying to a football. And I know that owners right now are banding together for support purposes. Prior Fisker employees are trying to help the general public with these. It's really cool to see. And I'm just using my very small influence on the EV community to help current owners that have no support or tools, just like I did with Tesla many years ago. But you know who does have tools? Squarespace, let's talk about it. It has tons of web page tools to help with your needs and all these awesome page templates to match your style. You can also start a completely personalized website with the new guided design system, Squarespace Blueprint. You can choose from professionally curated layout and styling options to build a unique online presence from the ground up. It's tailored to your brand or business and optimized for every device. You can launch your website and get discovered fast with integrated optimized SEO tools so you can show up more often to more people and grow the way you want. They also have flexible payments. Make checkout seamless for your customers with a simple but powerful payment tool. Accept credit cards, PayPal, and Apple Pay. And in eligible countries, offer customers the option to buy now and pay later with Afterpay and Clearpay. Head to www.squarespace.com slash richrebuilds to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain using the code in the description box below. Shout out to Squarespace for making platforms for people's passions, no matter how crazy they are. So now, let's dig into this Fisker Ocean and see if we got the deal of the century. This whole thing PPF? Yeah, look at this. Can you imagine spending this kind of money on a PPF job? They, this is like, at least a five, five to seven thousand dollar PPF job. So that you spend eighty grand on a car, and then you're just like, yeah, that's a, and then drive it for three hundred miles. Yeah, and then give, give it away. And then give it away. I didn't even, Joey. Good call. The whole thing. It's actually a nice job too. Yeah, it's a really nice job. Yeah, see, yeah, I can see the edges on the end. Of the I mean, that's. I mean, John. It's not bad though. I mean, well, I mean, you you saw how they did the McLaren dirty, right? The McLaren, they stopped, like, right here. <laughs> that, even the door handles. Really? Everything. Honestly, I would say for the price paid for this car, half bits in PPF. Yeah, I think so. And that's, carbon fiber. That's not bad at all, man. And so the front windows are tinted. Yeah, cool. Little car. Just to close it real quick, I want to see what 
looks like. Oh, it's definitely tinted. No, right. Here. Oh, these are tinted too, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they PPF the whole car, tinted the whole car, and then sold after 300 miles. The the dealership said the lady traded in on something else, and the car was fine. And they let it sit for too long, and it died. It bricked itself. So I think we can get this thing to work. I, I'm gonna start with removing the uh, painter's tape from the front. That's good. And idea. then I wanna get under the hood, and I'm gonna see if I can apply power to it and get it to start up. Oh, let me see what they do. So look how flimsy this is. Look at that. I mean, it doesn't matter because they don't want you to open it anyways. But. How, wait, how did this get dent? Oh. It hinges it hinge. hinge. The hinge is. Oh. It folded on itself. Yeah. This hinge is holding itself up. So, ready? Now it's locked. That's what bent the hood. Right. Ooh, that's what, how, what holds it up. That's what holds it up. And so we just grab it. Close it, now it bent the hood. Right. So, that piece right there. Ernie presents. Magically made fudge stripes. Is what hit right here. See it on the other side? That's what hit that. What is the side? Oh. And it's locked. What is it done? You're not supposed to open this. I know, but there should be two locks. One lock on that side, one on the other side. Ready? If I let it go, it does this. It's going to fold because of that. It's going to start. It starts buckling already. Yeah. Well, batteries. Oh, is this connected? Yeah. The batteries are disconnected. disconnected. All right. Well, let's see. Oh, there it is. As it drives forward and then runs over John. He wouldn't die, though. If he wouldn't get that lucky, he'd be paralyzed. Yep. From the, just his penis. <laughs> 1.6 volts. That's good. Okay, well that... Guys, we solved the problem. So John pulled the battery out of that... Remote. Remote, and he says it's dead. Right? Yep. You got a meter, right? Let's get the meter. Let's see, let's see how good John is. Supposed to be three volts. All right, I'll let the studio audience look first. I don't want John to see. Actually, Roger, hold it. Let's see, is John right? He's absolutely right. Look at that. He's very good at it. Well, John, don't throw it. A bird's gonna eat that. Yeah, so? You see, John just threw that battery away for a poor bird to eat it, but I made sure to pick it back up. The threat of climate change gets worse every day. Wildfires, heat waves, floods, and random batteries being thrown from cars, which is why we told you earlier this summer about how one of the best nonprofits fighting climate change is running their annual EV raffle fundraiser. And there are three reasons why you should buy a ticket right now to win a Rivian, Tesla, or Ionic 5 to help Chesapeake Climate Action Network slash Action Fund. Reason one, the tickets are way undersold. The drawing is less than 22 days away and the organizers still have about a third of the tickets unsold. That means the chances of any one ticket holder winning are ridiculously good. But wait, there's more. This year, each ticket in this raffle actually gets you not one, but two chances to win. And here's the second reason to buy. The prizes are amazing. First place gets your choice of the Rivian R1S or R1T or the Tesla Model X Plaid or even the hard to get Cybertruck. Second place gets you the amazing Hyundai Ionic 5. And the final reason, our friends at the Can Action Fund do amazing work. They use all the proceeds to directly fight climate change. To enter, visit www.evraffle.org. That's evraffle.org. Tickets are only 200 bucks, and the drawing, again, is big time undersold. So visit evraffle.org today. Now, before we go back in this episode fully, here is what we know about the car. It ran when parked. Another EV shop looked at the car first. After sitting for months, it didn't drive or charge. The 12 volt battery was replaced and it's currently on software version 1.11, which is pretty old. I think that came out in about December of last year and the newest version 2.0 has better management of vampire drain. So this could be some of the issue as well. The car arrived in neutral and the Fisker technician that was sent out to look at the car during the process was fired. Also, lastly, but pretty importantly, the high voltage battery is at zero. I bet you they didn't change this. Was this the problem the whole time? I heard that. I heard that. Oh, it's turning on. Oh, wait, are you thinking that it's turning on? The key is making, oh, look at that. The... I said it to 